work and learn. Meet light, meet max. Sakriya karagani mata my SLT app ka kato log winna. Work and learn. Meet light, meet max. Sakriya karagani mata my SLT app ka kato log winna. Ati the na budget ka kato sunlight budget ka te rupees siya pamanay. Hari masuloy. On first at nine tonight, this Friday, the second of December, two thousand twenty-two. Top priority: IMF chief says changes to the G20 debt restructuring framework needs to take place ASAP to help countries like Sri Lanka. Go home. MP Shanakin Razimanikam threatens to lead a go home campaign if China fails to help restructure Sri Lanka's debt. If the Chinese embassy and the Chinese government continuously does not work towards the benefit of the Sri Lankan people, I would like to warn the Chinese there will be a China go home soon and I will lead it. Easy going. Colombo ranked among the top 10 cheapest cities to live in the world. Migration and remittances. Sri Lanka together with South Asian peers Bangladesh and India to anticipate inflow drop. India said to receive record 100 billion dollars this year. World Bank suggests recent improvements may create an upturn in Sri Lanka. From Adaderana. This is Adaderana first at 9 with Andrew Bernard. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A very good evening and welcome to other than the 24's English news. Your top story for tonight: the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, believes that changes to the G20 debt restructuring process need to be sped up in order to help countries like Sri Lanka with debt treatment. Meanwhile, President of the World Bank, David Malpass, expressed concern over a lack of system in place to address defaulting for poor countries, while the world's Poorest countries now owe 62 billion US dollars in annual debt service to official bilateral creditors. Chief of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, said that changes to the G20 framework on debt restructuring were needed to speed up debt treatments. Speaking to Reuters next, the head of the Monetary Authority has stated that it is also necessary to freeze debt service payments once a country requested help and open up the process to middle-income countries like Sri Lanka. She went on to say that they are concerned that there is a risk for confidence in debt resolution to be eroded at a time when the level of debt is very high. Georgieva while adding that the IMF does not see a risk of a systematic debt crisis at this point, countries in debt distress were not large enough to trigger a crisis that would threaten financial stability. Meanwhile, President of the World Bank David Malpa speaking to Reuters next yesterday also said that the world's poorest countries now owe 62 billion US dollars in annual debt service to official bilateral creditors. He added that this is an increase of 35% over the past year, warning that the increased burden is increasing the risk of defaults. Malpa said that two-thirds of this debt burden is now owed to China, providing some details of the development lender's annual debt statistics report due next week. He said that he was worried about a disorderly default process where there's not a system to address debts for poor countries. Malpass also said that he was concerned about a build-up of debt in advanced economies such as the United States because this is drawing more capital away from developing countries. Speaking to Foreign Media, he said that as the interest rates go up, the debt service goes up for advanced economies, and that requires a big amount of capital from the world. Now, MP of the Lankai Tamil Nadu Sukachi Shanakian Razamanakiam today warned the Chinese government of leading a China Go Home protest if measures are not taken to help Sri Lanka restructure its debt. The member of parliament accused the Chinese government of intentionally giving loans to Sri Lanka, knowing of its economic crisis. The Tamil National Alliance MP was responded to recent comments made by the Chinese embassy to a statement. in made in parliament earlier this week 
China's economy is 20 trillion. That is 20,000 billion, if I'm not mistaken. 20 trillion is 20,000 billion. So out of the 20 trillion, all that Sri Lanka owes China in total, 3 billion to the China Development Bank and 4.3 billion to the China Exim Bank. So altogether, what the country owes China is 7.4 billion. When you lent money to this country, you knew the economy was collapsing. But you still went ahead and gave money just to get Sri Lanka caught in this Chinese debt trap. So if you did this knowingly, you had information. I mean, you're not stupid. You have economy of 20 trillion. You think you're stupid to come and lend money to a country that where the economy is crashing. You knew this. So right now, why can't you help the people of Sri Lanka and write this off? At least right now, what we are asking is to restructure this, to reschedule these loans. Billion of Sidakthina Chini Atram Lanka Yaluanang. May Api diesel liter million amad deno, Hal Laksa kilo Padeno, one at the Dogan. Beko may Naya Mulumani Makaparin. Api Naya Mulumani Makaparin at the Api Protivio Gatagaran Grillan. Ekatahari Udogaran. As Sri Lankans, 22 million people, we might be divided on ethnicity and religion and all that. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, we will all unite together. As 22 million Sri Lankans, we will unite together. That's what we did. Go to go home was something that all Sri Lanka united to do. But if the Chinese embassy and the Chinese government continuously does not work towards the benefit of the Sri Lankan people. If the Chinese government and the embassy don't look after the interests of the people by restructuring this debt, I would like to warn the Chinese, there will be a China go home soon and I will lead it. I don't think we should take a position as such to say that we will lead or somebody will lead a China go home. Let us work together. But I don't think we should be so harsh. Let's work a solution. That's all. Our Honorable Harsha De Silva commented on a speech that was just made by my colleague. You are, no, you allowed him to, no, you, no, you allowed him to say that. It's on record. You can't allow one member to comment on a speech of another member in the opposition. That is Dr. Harsha De Silva's opinion. That has no relevance. He should not comment on the propriety of a speech made by another member. I want uh, Dr. Harsha De Silva, please don't interfere with the expression of views by other members of parliament. You are not the minister. Okay. You are another member in the okay. opposition. Please don't interfere with our views. Point of order because he mentioned my name. Kya ne mera kai? Mama kiwa ona ke ne ta aitiya thi na ona kata wa kya na? Mama tum aage aitiya pili mande ona mera kata karane. Mama kata karane rata wal deka katra thi na sambandh ta wa pili mande. Acha hai. Makada 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 point of order. Point of order is it out of order? It's totally out of order for honourable member to be commenting like this. That is totally out of order. That is the point of order that I'm raising. Right, honourable Harsha De Silva, your entire opinion. I express my view in this house. Now, the SJB or the JVP or the SLP or the SLFP might not want to get on the wrong side of China because you all probably want to come back into power, stay in power. But for us, we respect the country's citizens' values. The Sri Lanka has welcomed 59,759 tourists in November, the highest since April this year, as tourist arrivals continue to record an improvement. Tourism authorities set a revised target of 800,000 arrivals for this year. Up until November, 628,000 tourists have visited the country so far this year. The November number is the highest since 62,980 arrivals recorded in April when the currency collapsed and the country fell into a financial crisis. In March, 106,500 tourists visited the island. November's 59,759 tourists were led by 13,820 Russians and 10,167 Indians, 5,169 Germans. Now, Colombo has been ranked as one of the top 10 cheapest cities to live in by the Worldwide Cost of Living Intelligence Survey. On the other end of the spectrum, New York and the city of Singapore were ranked the most expensive cities to live in. According to this year's Worldwide Cost of Living Survey carried out by the Economist Intelligence Unit, Colombo has been ranked amongst the 10 cheapest cities in the world. The city was ranked at 161, tying with Bangalore in India and Algiers in Algeria. The city of Damascus in Syria, the city of Tripoli in Libya and Tehran in Iran were ranked among the lowest at 172, 171 and 170 respectively, reflecting their weak economies and currencies, making them the top three cities that are the least expensive in the world to live in. On the other end of the spectrum, New York topped the rankings for the first time, tying with Singapore. The EIU noted, however, that this year's WCOL survey was severely affected by the soaring inflation rates, with Caracas in Venezuela having recorded the highest inflation rates. 
Meanwhile, the product most affected is petrol prices. The survey indicated attributing the 22% increase in currency weaknesses as oil is seen priced in US dollars. While the citizens of not only Colombo but across Sri Lanka staged several protests demanding that fuel prices be reduced, the WCOL survey stated that such protests were seen from Sri Lanka to Spain owing to this dramatic rise in local petrol prices. They noted, however, that in Istanbul, Turkey, and Colombo, where currency crashes have made imported oil very expensive, petrol prices have soared by an eye-watering 148% and 189% respectively in local currency terms. The migrant worker remittances to Sri Lanka are expected to decline in 2022 as domestic and external shocks hit the country simultaneously. Remittance inflows to Bangladesh and Pakistan are also anticipated to drop accordingly to a World Bank report, but as a regional remittance flows to South Asia are expected to grow by 3.5% to reach 163 billion US dollars in 2022, benefiting from the strong performance in India and Nepal. Now, India's remittances are expected to reach a milestone $100 billion this year. According to the latest World Bank Migration and Development Brief, Indians are set to receive $100 billion in remittances this year, the first time in a single country has reached that number. In total, the number of money sent back home by migrants around the world has grown by 5% in 2022. Other top recipient countries for remittances include Mexico, China, Egypt and the Philippines. While India and Nepal have experienced an increase in remittances, the report showed that other countries in South Asia have seen a decline of more than 10% in the last year. Remittances to Sri Lanka plummeted by 35% in 2022 to $3.6 billion from $5.5 billion in 2021, reflecting a full-blown economic crisis triggered by an earlier political crisis and the more recent global economic slowdown. However, the report projects recent improvements in Sri Lanka's political situation and the implementation of an IMF program, which should boost confidence in the banking system, leading to a small upturn in officially recorded remittances, expected to grow by 2.8% to $3.7 billion. US dollars. As a share of GDP, remittances in 22 are projected to rise to 22% in Nepal and to range from 8% in Pakistan to 4.5% in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Despite reaching a historic milestone at 100 billion US dollars and retaining its position as the top recipient of remittances globally, India's remittance flows are expected to account for only 3% of GDP in 2022. The Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issuer default rating has been downgraded to CC from its former position of CCC by Fitch Ratings Agency today. The rating agency, however, stated that if the country completes a commercial debt restructuring and the government puts local currency debt service on a sustainable path and avoids a default rather or debt restructuring, the country's current rating could be upgraded. Fitch Ratings has downgraded Sri Lanka's long-term local currency issuer default rating to CC from CCC and has affirmed the long-term foreign currency IDR to restricted default. Fitch downgraded the long-term foreign currency IDR to RD following the expiry of the 30-day grace period on coupon payments that were due on the 18th of April 2022. Fitch stated that Sri Lanka continues to service its local currency debt, but the downgrade of the long-term local currency IDR reflects the view of Fitch ratings that a local currency default is probable in view of an unattendably high domestic interest payment, revenue ratio, high interest costs, tight domestic financing conditions and rising local currency debt. Reliance on the central bank's financing has increased as domestic options are limited. Fitch Ratings stated that domestic debt rose to about 53% of government debt by end July 2022. Treasury bill issuance has been increasing. The ratings agency stated that they expect local debt restructuring would aim to maintain financial system stability, for example by extending maturities or lowering coupon payments rather than a reduction in face value. Sri Lanka continues to service its local currency debt. Meanwhile, the rating agency stated that Sri Lankan banks' access to foreign currency funding is constrained by the sovereign default. Any local currency debt restructuring would alleviate funding and liquidity stress given the predominance of local currency funding at 74% of the total and large holdings of local currency-denominated government securities. In the meantime, Fitch Rating stated that the long-term local currency IDR would be further downgraded if the government announces plans to restructure or default 
on its local currency denominated debt. However, it stated that the completion of a commercial debt restructuring that fits judges to have nominalized the relationship with private sector creditors could lead to an upgrade from the current rating. In addition, if the government puts local currency debt service on a sustainable path and avoids a default or debt restructuring, this would also lead to a positive rating action. Welcome back. Now, President Ranil Vikram Singh requested the Maldives to invest in Sri Lanka's high-tech agriculture sector, cruise tourism and high-end tourism sectors considering the long-standing friendship between the Maldives and Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan head of state extended the invitation during a meeting with Vice President of Maldives, Faisal Nazim, at the Presidential Secretariat today. President Vikram Singh also requested the Maldives to join hands with Sri Lanka to establish the Climate Change University in the country. The two parties also discussed the growing drug menace affecting this region and President Ranil Vikramasinghe sought the assistance of the Maldives in combating the drug scourge. President Vikramasinghe also told the Maldivian Vice President that he intends to invite the Maldivian President to Sri Lanka as soon as his residence, destroyed during the July protest, is rebuilt. The Foreign Minister Alice Sabri calling on USA Administrator Samantha Power in Washington, D.C. has held discussions on obtaining further assistance to the country. The Sri Lankan lawmaker arrived in the United States on the 29th of November on an invitation extended by Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He is also slated to meet the U.S. State Secretary, members of Congress and other senior interlocutors of the U.S. government during this visit. Sabri will return to the island on the 4th of December. Now China has ordered its top four state-owned banks to issue offshore loans to help developers repay overseas debt. This would be Beijing's latest support measure for the cashed-out property sector. Two people with knowledge on the matter told Reuters that China has stepped up support in recent weeks to undo a liquidity seize that has stifled the sector, which makes up a quarter of the world's second largest economy and has been a key driver of growth. A growing list of developers has defaulted on overseas credit obligations over the past year, prompting some analysis to warn that such disruptions could blunt foreign investors' appetite for fresh debt issuance by Chinese companies. Now a debt maturity wall blooms for developers with 39 million US dollars of debt set to mature in the first quarter of next year and 10 billion US dollars of that is denominated in dollars. Each of the four banks, Bank of China, China Construction Bank, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and the Agricultural Bank of China will pick several developers to fund. Beijing's aggressive support for the poverty sector represents a retreat from a crackdown began in 2020, targeting speculators and indebted developers in a bid to reduce financial risk. The U.S. Federal Reserve officials have signaled plans for a half-point interest rate hike at their meeting this month and while that would be a step down from recent rate increases, new projections issued then could show a policy rate hike headed towards levels last seen on the eve of the 2007 financial crisis. Moreover, in an outlook that could lean against market expectations for rate cuts by the end of next year, the 19 U.S. central bankers' new forecast may well show the federal funds rate remaining at the elevated level at least through 2023. The updated outlooks will be a fresh chance for Fed officials to show how their raise could hold strategy in expected to play out in terms of the ultimate level of an overnight policy rate and the progress of growth inflation and an unemployment in what they hope is a resilient economy. The rate-setting Federal Open Market Committee meets on the 13th of December and 14th, capping a volatile year that saw the central bank respond to the fastest outbreak of inflation since the 1980s, with the fastest increase in interest rates since then to try to offset it. Now, the All Share Price Index closed in green territory today as a result of price gains in counters such as Sampath Bank, Lanka IOC and the Commercial Bank. Market turnover crossed 4 billion rupees today. The SBI closed the day at 8,770, gaining 66 points. 
Similar behavior was witnessed in the S&P SL20. High net worth and institutional investor participation was noted in Expo Lanka Holdings, Colombo Fortland and Buildings and John Keels Holdings. Mixed interest was observed in Lanka IOC, First Capital Holdings and Sampat Bank, whilst retail interest rate was noted in Brown's Investment, SMB Leasing and LOLC Finance. Furthermore, foreigners remained active, closing as net buyers. During the week, the SPI and the S&P SL20 gained 7.6% and 9.3% respectively, whilst recording an average daily turnover of 3.16 billion rupees. Now, the US dollar slipped to a five-month low and the yuan was set for the biggest weekly gain since 2005. Now, let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee performed today. Welcome back. Now, the US and its Asian allies have imposed sanctions on three North Korean senior officials associated with the country's recent missile tests. Pyongyang launched a record number of ballistic missiles, more than 60 this year, and tested several intercontinental ballistic missiles. John Il Ho, Yu Jin, and Kim Soo Gil allegedly played major roles in developing the weapons. Japan, South Korea, and the EU have also imposed similar sanctions. North Korea has faced tough sanctions imposed by Western countries for years. Under these new sanctions, all US-based assets of North Korean officials will be frozen. They will be barred from any transactions with any business or individual in the United States. A six-member committee has been appointed to inquire into the incidents reported against Sri Lanka cricket players during their recent tour in Australia for the ICC T20 World Cup. Minister of Sports and Youth Affairs Roshan Ranasinghe appointed the committee pursuant of Article 39.3 of the Sports Act No. 25 of 1973. The panel is chaired by retired Supreme Court Judge Kusala Sarojin Veeravartanam. Meanwhile, former Ministerial Secretary Kingsley Fernando, retired DIG Sudat Nagalagamua, retired Rear Admiral Ananda Piris, former cricketer Nalin D. Alvis, and attorney at law Shalne Roshana will serve as members of the committee. Sri Lanka's national cricket squad was in Australia from the 16th of October to the 13th of November 2022 to take part in the ICC T20 World Cup. That's all the news we have for this evening. Join us again tomorrow at the very same time for the very latest news. Until then, visit our website www.adhadharana.lk for more news. Have a pleasant evening and good night.